webinar is Arthritis, Not Just a Nuisance Condition of Old Age, an overview of findings from the CLSA. We have a couple of distinguished speakers today, and I would like to welcome them. Dr. Elizabeth Badley is a senior scientist in the Division of Healthcare and Outcomes Research at the Cremville Research Institute, University Health Network, Toronto. She's a professor emeritus in the Division of Epidemiology at the Dalla Lana School of Public Health, University of Toronto. Anthony, Dr. Anthony Peruccio is also a scientist in the Division of Healthcare and Outcomes Research and the Arthritis Program at the Crimville Research Institute and assistant professor at the Dalai Lama School. They share research interests in understanding the personal and population impact of musculoskeletal disorders, particularly osteoarthritis, through the analysis of population-based as well as clinical data. So I'd like to welcome our distinguished speakers. Uh, I will go ahead and turn it over to begin the webinar. Hello, thank you, and welcome all of you. This is Elizabeth Badley speaking. If you hear from Michelle Giza, that's my alternative name. So don't be confused. There's not three of us. There's not three of us here. There's just two of us, and I'm sitting here with Anthony. Uh, I'm going to start, and then I'm going to hand over to Anthony, and then uh, we, we will come back to me again. Okay, and I just got to work out how to change these slides. Okay, so our general objectives in this webinar is to pre present some preliminary findings of our work in progress and perhaps indicate a little bit where we're going next. And also uh, to suggest areas where further development of the CMSA questionnaires are required. These are sort of areas where we've sort of said, oh, I wish they'd done that. So we will be moving on in that area. And, but first of all, we're going to be using data from the baseline CLSA data. And just to remind you, it's a population age 45 to 85. And we're using questionnaire data, the self-report questionnaire data from the tracking sample and the comprehensive sample. And wherever possible, you'll see that we've combined the two. So first of all, arthritis. So what is arthritis? Technically, arthritis means inflammation of the joint. Um, but this term is generally used for a family of related conditions which affect, affect the joints, such as components of the joints, sort of the, like the synovium and um, cartilage, and uh, associated structures such as ligaments, tendons, and underlying bones. What these family of our uh, conditions have in common is that they cause pain, swelling, and stiffness in the joints. And one complication of studying arthritis is there's over 100 different conditions. So this slide lists some of the major types of arthritis. The most common type of arthritis by far is osteoarthritis, which has a population prevalence of at least 14% and probably a lot higher. Um, gout is another form of arthritis, affects mainly men with a prevalence of about 4%. Um, the types of arthritis we perhaps hear most about, things like rheumatoid arthritis, belong in the category of inflammatory arthritis, um, which has a whole bunch of conditions, inflammatory rheumatoid, reactive arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and taken together, these have a prevalence of about 1% to 2%. But tend to be more seriously disabling. And then there are connected tissue diseases such as systemic lupus, erythematosus, which have a prevalence of about 0.01%, 1 in 1,000. We're going to be talking mainly about osteoarthritis in this talk. So osteoarthritis is characterized by deterioration in the cartilage and other structures in one or more joints. And this deterioration and the problem with other joints, including some inflammation, leads to joint damage, to pain, and to stiffness in the joint. And osteoarthritis typically affects the knees, spine, hands, hips, and feet. And it's, now osteoarthritis is important not because, not only because of its high frequency in the population, it's often written off as sort of fairly minor complaints, but it is a major cause in the population of pain and disability. Uh, and through the pain and disability affecting things like self-care, mobility, employment. And through this, it has an impact on quality of life. 
has a substantial impact on healthcare utilisation. It's one of the most common conditions consulted for in primary care and is an important cause of hospitalisation, particularly for surgery for hip and knee joint replacement. And, and taken together, these create an economic burden to society where actually most of the burden is in indirect costs due to lost productivity and cost to the individual. It's often thought of as relatively benign and not associated with mortality, but, in, but recent research is showing that osteoarthritis is associated with an increased risk of mortality, particularly from heart disease. And in a way, we can, we're almost beginning to think of it as a sort of separate risk factor for heart disease, a neglected one. So it is an important condition. And I'm going to hand over now to Anthony to talk about the etiology. Good afternoon, everyone. So when we look at the etiology of osteoarthritis, it's been traditionally characterized as a wear and tear condition with joint damage uh, predominantly caused by mechanical factors. So overloading of the joints, uh, in quotes, uh, overuse of, uh, of joints. So the typical diagram of the etiology of osteoarthritis has looked something like this. So recognizing that older age and female sex is associated with osteoarthritis, uh, studies in genetics have really been inconsistent but a focus on the local environment and mechanical uh, factors, so such as obesity leading to uh, overloaded joints, this leading then to altered joint loading and a cascade down to uh, osteoarthritis in the joint. With that said, however, we know that OA is associated with obesity uh, particularly the knee, which is a load-bearing joint. But we also know that uh, obesity is associated with hand OA, so a non-load-bearing joint. We also know from uh, epidemiological studies that it appears that individuals with OA have a higher prevalence of specific conditions compared to non-OA populations. And these include hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes. In addition, we know that many people with osteoarthritis have OA in more than one joint, uh, load-bearing and non-load-bearing joints. And so recognizing this, the characterization of OA has changed so that it is now viewed as a heterogeneous condition that in addition to mechanical etiology, also has a metabolic or a systemic etiology. So that the diagram now looks something like this with the inclusion of systemic factors in there, and in particular, inflammation and obesity. So that the common pathology that we see in the middle of this diagram can have uh, different etiological pathways. So I'm going to transition to osteoarthritis in the population and some of the challenges uh, that we have had. Lisa has already mentioned that there are uh, many different types of arthritis, with OA being the most common. But the problem has been that most uh, population-based health surveys focus on arthritis in general. And this has made it uh, somewhat difficult to be able to distinguish between individuals with different ideological profiles. Uh, as well, I've said that individuals with OA can have OA in multiple joints. However, most of the uh, epidemiological uh, research in OA has focused on individual joints and most commonly, this has been uh, the knee. So the special feature of the uh, CLSA study is that it asks about OA specifically in uh, individual joints, and in this case, the knee, the hip, and the hand. And in addition, uh, questions are asked about joint-specific symptoms. So we believe that the CLSA uh, offers the potential for uh, us to look at some unique insights 
into OA that has not been possible with other uh, uh, health surveys in Canada. So against the backdrop that osteoarthritis is often perceived as uh, an inevitable condition of aging, our goal was to understand the impact of osteoarthritis across the age ranges in the uh, CLSA. And with this in mind, our objectives were to document the prevalence of osteoarthritis, to investigate the relationship between OA, obesity, and what we are calling here metabolic comorbidities, and to document the prevalence of pain and disability in OA of the knee, hip, and hand. So the CLA asked, the CLSA, sorry, uh, asked participants whether a doctor had ever told them that they had osteoarthritis in the knee, in the hip, or in the hand, whether they had rheumatoid arthritis, or any other type of arthritis. For this presentation, when we talk about individuals with osteoarthritis, we are referring to individuals that responded yes to any of the knee, hip, or hand uh, OA questions. As well, uh, whether or not individuals reported having uh, arthritis, they were also asked about uh, joint symptoms uh, during the past four weeks. So for uh, the knee and the hip, individuals were asked about pain on most days and pain on activity, in addition to asthma swelling in the knee for those individuals. For the hand, uh, individuals were asked during the past four weeks whether they had pain in the small joints, the tips of the fingers, and in the, uh, the base of the thumb, which where we know is uh, always quite common. There were two separate questions asked of uh, individuals uh, who reported, uh, or sorry, not who reported, but about hand uh, uh, symptoms, number three and number four. Three and four for the hand were not included for what we later call symptomatic OA. So symptomatic OA here was based on all of the questions for the knee and the hip and number one and two for the hand. So some of our findings. <clears throat> Osteoarthritis was certainly one of the more uh, common conditions in this population. 26% uh, of the CLSA respondents reported uh, having osteoarthritis. So more than three and a half million Canadians reporting have osteoarthritis in the 45 to uh, 85 year age group. Uh, we know that this is an underestimate. The questions here were specific to uh, the knee, the hip, and the hand. Uh, there were no questions about back osteoarthritis, uh, shoulder osteoarthritis, or any other joint uh, for that matter, foot, uh, OA, which we know can be quite common in, uh, in women. So certainly an, uh, an underestimate. The prevalence of osteoarthritis is uh, higher in women than in men, and this is common across age groups. The prevalence increases uh, with age, and it has been this increase that has really led to that perception that osteoarthritis is a disease of older age. But what we have included here in these graphs is this green line that shows the number of people with osteoarthritis. The majority of individuals reporting a diagnosis of osteoarthritis are in fact below the age of 65. And so I think that you can appreciate the implications of these individuals living 20, 30, 40 years with this uh, painful and uh, disabling condition. We have included here uh, similar graphs, one based on the comprehensive sample, the other on the tracking sample. The point here was simply to show how very similar uh, the findings were uh, from an OA perspective. And so for the most part, the, uh, the rest of the presentation looks at uh, the pooled uh, sample. 
I indicated that individuals with osteoarthritis can have uh, OA in multiple joint sites. We see this in the CLSA as well. One third of individuals reporting osteoarthritis had it in more than one joint. The reporting of multi-site OA was common across uh, age groups. Uh, you'll see even within the youngest age group that one-fifth of individuals with osteoarthritis uh, indeed had uh, OA in multiple sites. If we break this down further by uh, OA duration, we still see that irrespective of age, um, multi-site OA is common and irrespective of duration, so that even in those individuals with a recent diagnosis and in the younger uh, age groups, multi-site OA is common. So I introduced the, the, the uh, OA, obesity, and uh, metabolic uh, triad, if you will, and the speculation that OA uh, may have a systemic etiology. And if so, we hypothesized that the relationship between obesity and uh, osteoarthritis would be stronger for those individuals with multi-joint versus single-site OA, that a higher proportion of those with multi-joint osteoarthritis would have what we are calling here metabolic syndrome-associated comorbidities, so hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes, and that respondents with osteoarthritis would have a greater likelihood of having uh, these metabolic-associated comorbidities compared to individuals uh, who do not report a diagnosis of OA. Uh, looking at the prevalence of obesity, the prevalence certainly higher in those individuals reporting multi-site uh, compared to single-site osteoarthritis. Again, you'll see that this is the case across uh, age ranges. When we look at the prevalence of these conditions that we are sort of labeling metabolic conditions, higher prevalence in those individuals reporting multi-site OA versus single-site OA and what we've included as well here is uh, the prevalence of these three conditions in the non-OA population. And so you'll certainly see that the prevalence is higher in those individuals with osteoarthritis. Uh, we recognize that there are gonna be uh, age distribution differences and obesity distribution differences between these groups. So what we did is we looked at using a Poisson regression analysis, looking at the outcome here is reporting a diagnosis of osteoarthritis versus not, looking at a number of factors that have been identified or have been postulated to be uh, associated with osteoarthritis. The regression here uh, adjusts for uh, education, household income, smoking status and uh, alcohol consumption, but these are, are not shown here. So individual, uh, rather uh, women, more likely than men to report a diagnosis of OA. Increasing age, uh, more likely to report a diagnosis of OA as we expected. Individuals who are overweight and obese, more likely to report a diagnosis of osteoarthritis. Looking at those uh, metabolic conditions that we were interested in, the more of these uh, metabolic conditions um, that were reported, the more likely an individual reported a diagnosis of osteoarthritis. And in addition, the reporting of other chronic conditions also uh, associated with an increased likelihood of reporting a diagnosis of OA. When we looked at the subsample of individuals with osteoarthritis in the, C, in the CLSA with uh, an interest in looking at multiple versus single site OA, women more likely than men to report multi-site versus single site disease. Uh, for the age groups compared to the youngest age group, 
uh, older individuals are more likely to report multi-site OA. But notice here that uh, the estimates are, in fact, quite stable across the age groups. So that there wasn't very much a difference between age groups uh, in the likelihood of reporting multiple versus single site OA. Individuals who are obese more likely to report multiple versus single site OA. We did not find a statistically significant uh, uh, difference for the metabolic conditions and multi-site OA, although we certainly saw uh, the increasing trend with increasing metabolic conditions. I want to point out here that uh, the sample size has been reduced compared to the previous slide uh, that we showed you, so that, for instance, the metabolic conditions here, that three category, only 3% of individuals with OA reside in that category. Uh, so, I mean, it was not unexpected that we would not find uh, something statistically uh, significant. Uh, with the caveat as well that this is a sort of a, a, a crude representation of metabolic syndrome, and this certainly is something that would uh, need to be refined, and I know Lisa is going to touch on this a bit uh, in, in a later slide. And again, individuals with more uh, chronic conditions were more likely to report multiple uh, site uh, OA versus single site. And I apologize, I apologize, I forgot to mention that these were also adjusted by uh, SES uh, status and smoking and, uh, and alcohol. So at this point, I'll transition back to Lisa to talk about the impact of OA. Okay, well. We, as Anthony, well, there's a, there's a question on symptomatic OA in the past four weeks. These are people with any size OA who report symptoms in the joints in the last four weeks. And overall, 70% of respondents had symptoms in the last four weeks. And as perhaps might be expected, respondents with more than one joint site were more likely to have symptomatic OA. But the thing I really want to point out is this does not differ by age. For both one site and multi site OA, the proportion reporting symptomatic OA is, is similar. So it doesn't, it doesn't look like that you get OA as a young person and it's fairly trivial, and as you get older, it gets worse. If you have OA, you have OA, and it doesn't really matter how old you are. If you're in that 45 to 54 age group, you have OA, you're on average going to be as likely to be symptomatic as somebody who is 85, 75 to 85. The other thing I want to point out, because it will become important later, is in that more than one site, 90% of the population had symptomatic OA. So it seems that having OA is an indicator of um, sort of more general severity, which would sort of kind of fit in with the metabolic hypothesis. As well as asking questions about symptomatic OA, the CLSA asks some general pain questions to all respondents. And these are the same questions that we are asked, are asked in the Canadian Community Health Surveys. So the um, STEM question is, are you usually free of pain or discomfort? And for those people who said no, pain severity was asked in a supplementary question, how would you describe the usual intensity of your pain or discomfort? Would you say it's mild, moderate, or severe? And then limitation in activities due to pain was assessed by asking whether pain or discomfort limited a none, a few, or some, or most activities. So looking now at the impact, the answers to these questions in ROA population, uh, we find, as with joint symptoms, pain has little experience in the influence of pain and the experience of pain in people with OA. And these slides that I'm showing you now are looking at pain only in people with OA, not, not with other conditions. Overall, 60% of the population have at least some pain, some general pain. This is not attributed to OA, and arguably most of it might be OA, but we don't know. I also want to point out that the overall prevalence of pain in the overall population was 70%, so it's a little bit lower. So people with OA who have pain in their joints are not necessarily reporting general pain, which is something we found actually in other studies. When we look at symptomatic or non-symptomatic OA, um, people with symptomatic OA are like 
uh, and higher prevalence of them report pain. But even in people with non-symptomatic OE, about 40% are reporting pain. It could be due to other conditions, but likely some of it is attributable to OA. When we look at the prevalent respondents reporting pain by site of OA, we find that more than one site more likely to report pain. And uh, I just want to point out here, it was 90% of the group with more than one site OA had symptomatic OA. And we're finding 80% or less of the population in this particular group report, report any kind of general pain. So there's a bit of a discordance here. Once again, there's no age gradient. So it's not that OA gets more severe over time as you, as you get older. If you have OA, you, you have painful joints. There was a, as I indicated, there was a companion question asking about limitation in carrying out activities due to pain. Uh, this is a proportion just under 60% who report any kind of limitation um, on carrying out activities due to pain. I think it's actually, you no, know, it's more than a few. So more than a few limitations. It's once again flat with age. And when we actually look at multi site OA and symptomatic OA, we see the same kind of patterns as we found for severity of pain. So I, I will not go through those in detail. So turning now to difficulty with activities. Participants in the tracking sample and in the tracking sample only were asked about the difficulties in 14 basic activities. Um, they also said that they couldn't do these activities or the doctor had ordered them not to do them. Um, this is only a minority and in, for the purposes of these slides, we've coded these people as having difficulty. So these are the top 10 of the 14 activities which people report difficulty with. Um, the most frequent one was stooping, crouching or kneeling down where, where more than half of respondents would go with OA reported difficulty. If you think this is something you perhaps don't do very often, you mean just think about um, putting your socks on, feeding your pet, picking something off the floor. We probably do this far more than we ever think we do. Um, the second most common activity was uh, standing up after sitting in the chair, and I presume most of you were sitting down, and in a few minutes you will be standing up. And so if you have OA, more than Almost half of you would have, well, 40% of you would have had some difficulty in doing this. Other, other activities are standing for long periods. Forceful activities using the upper limb, it means using the hand, the arm, or thing to do things like grip or hold things, things that involve um, for, um, force through the joints. And walking up and down stairs are also a problem, uh, as well as walking and mobility in general. And overall, 76, three quarters of the population with OA reported having a difficulty with at least one of these, and over half had more than two difficulties. And when we look by age, we see that the proportion, once again similar, paralleling the results to pain, who have more than two difficulties is similar for each age group, and people with one side OA have are slightly less likely to report difficulty than people having OA in more than one site. Activities of daily living were, um, were asked about in both the tracking sample and the comprehensive sample, and we're combining data and these. And that when people were asked about activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living that they could carry out without help, with help, or not at all. And um, this is, this questionnaire is actually the, was the Older American Resources and Service Multidimensional Functional Assessment. And I will point out that it is being used for people who are 45 uh, to 65. So not all this population is but not by no means older population. And um, these are the, some of the items in the questionnaire. The response options were help except for one item shown at the bottom of the slide which is trouble getting to the bathroom one time. And this was just a yes, no question. Do you have a trouble getting to the bathroom on time? And in fact, this was the activity that was reported most often, where almost a fifth of people with OA reported difficult trouble getting to the bathroom on time. And trouble is more like 
the question on difficulty. So what we did was take this question out and insert it into the questions we've already seen about difficulties with daily activities. And you can see on the slide shown by the pink arrows and the dark bar, this is where this activity fits in the people who have difficulty. So it would be in the top 10 of difficulties of people with OA. Um, and it's something, in fact, when we think about mobility difficulties, it's something we often don't actually think about. One of the most crucial reasons we might have for mobility is perhaps to get to the bathroom on time. And this is a substantial problem in people with OA. So this shows the, the next slide here shows the proportion with all the difficulty in all these activities. You can see getting to the bathroom on time, the yes, no question about trouble stands out. So what I've done is I've just in the next, just I've blanked it out so we can look at the questions which report um, needing help. And the most frequent uh, activity where people report needing help is doing housework. But we should also remember, in fact, that this is one of the activities for which it's perhaps most culturally or acceptable to ask for help or have somebody to do help. And I imagine that many people, many of you now here, actually probably pay somebody to do your housework for you. I certainly do as a family. So you know, sometimes getting help in housework is a survival activity for people. Um, so doing housework was the most frequently reported, and all the other activities that, uh, were reported by less than 5% of the population in terms of needing help. And if you would, can you contrast in this in your mind with the high proportion of people who had difficulty doing activities, including difficulties like that would in, be involved in things like walking and shopping and taking a bath, and also the high proportion of the population who reported pain because of their osteoarthritis. And I'll return back to this later. So 14%, overall 14% of the population reported needing help or being able to do one of these activities. And if we exclude household kids, it's 8%. So only a minority. When we actually go look at how this relates to the if you like the severity of OA in terms of whether they have one site or multiple site OA, we see that those people with multiple site OA, arguably more severe OA, are more likely to need help. And ex excluding the older age group where we slightly have a lot of comorbidity and frailty and things, once again, there was no very little age gradient. And even these 40, and with the 45 to 54 age group, to be just as likely to need help with at least one ADL as people in the older age groups. So, in summary, in the population, the majority of people with OA are below the age of 65. So we can't discount this as being purely a disease of the elderly, a normal part of getting old. And something that you just have to put up with in old age because that's what you get in old age. There are a substantial proportion of people here who are 45 to 64. There is some evidence uh, for a metabolic systemic component to OA. However, how we conceptualize metabolic syndrome here is very crude. We just looked at obesity in three particular conditions. We're aware that the um, comprehensive sample has some biologic measures, um, and one of our future plans is to look to add to our results here by including the biologic measures, particularly looking at waste to hip ratio as well as obesity. Uh, and I can tell you that the results for waste to hip ratio are pretty much the same. And also actually looking at some of the blood values, um, looking at uh, cholesterol and lipids. Blood glucose. And blood glucose, yeah. which is, are, are all part of metabolic syndrome. Um, you've probably got tired of me telling you already that there's a little difference by age in the proportion of people with symptomatic OA, severity of pain, difficulty with activities, or needing help. But this, this raises questions for us about the implications for aging with OA, including the implications 
of living for many years with pain and disability and multimorbidity. And this perhaps is something that we need to think about when we're looking at subsequent waves of the CLSA. I mean, just. And secondly, and so, well, lastly, rather, generally people with multi joint OA will generally wall us off, which has uh, major implications both from the CLSA but also for epidemiological studies in general. We really do need to pay more attention to OA as a multi joint condition, not, separ not looking separately as OA as a osteoarthritis of the knee or osteoarthritis of the hand. It needs to join rheumatoid arthritis and some of the other kinds of arthritis has been recognized as something that affects many joints, as you can imagine. I mean, the more joints affected, the more problems you're likely to have. In doing this, we were limited by the questions asked in the CLSA. And we had a number of things where we said, if only they had, or I wish they had, or please could they. <laughs> So first of all, a more practical question. I can understand why the CLSA asked about three joints. These are the, perhaps the three most common joints or the three most talked about joints in OA. But it misses, as Anthony has already pointed out, osteoarthritis in other joints. So I suggest we need to ask questions about osteoarthritis in other joints, including about osteoarthritis in the back, which is probably much neglected. I mean, in primary care, no, but in in population studies, certainly yes. And another suggestion would be to include a homunculus or list asking about symptoms in all major joints. I mean, this has been used in the um, um, studies of living with chronic diseases as adjunct to the SLC, or the SLCDC adjunct to the CCHS on arthritis. And it's perfectly feasible to do and is well answered just the list. And this would actually enable us to look at patterns associated with multi-joint OA and, and actually multi-joint other arthritis. The um, CLSA only asked about difficulty with some basic activities to the sample in the tracking into the track in the tracking sample. The questions about ADL specific, and these are the questions in the tracking sample, sort of general things like sort of standing stairs and things like this. The specific ADL questions, the actions of daily living questions like dressing and looking after yourself, and the IADL questions like shopping and household activities were only asked about were, were asked about using the oars and it was it was and we're and only focused on needing help. So we need to ask about difficulty with ADL and IADL, particularly bearing in mind the high proportion of difficulty with these basic activities. I would anticipate a high proportion of people with OA have difficulty with OA with ADL and I ADL, and particularly I think we when we actually. Uh, and ask about difficulty, we probably get a truer measure than we do when asking about needing help because, as I've already indicated, needing help is partly partially culturally determined. I'm much more likely to ask for help with my housework than I am to ask for help dressing or going to the bathroom. So I, I suggest that the, AD, the, we are, the CLSA ask ADL, IADL difficulty questions, both to the tracking and comprehensive sample, so that we can study the evolution of dependence and frailty, if you want to look at it that way, and relate this to physical measures. And one possibility would be to mod modify the ORS questions to add a difficulty response option, which could be done relatively easily. And then finally, I think. More generally, we need better pain measures in the CLSA because pain is relevant to many conditions and it's certainly relevant to aging and one of the major complaints in aging. Discomfort is not the same as pain. And as I've already indicated, people may respond differently to, que to general questions like, do you usually have pain? Is very different from questions about, do you have pain in a particular site or do you always have pain? Or do you have always have severe pain, or do you have pain that comes and goes? So I think uh, one of the issues I would suggest one of the issues is to consider including a more complex pain question, and including possibly the site of the pain, the quality of the pain, the temporality of the pain, temporality of the pain, whether it comes and goes, whether it's pain at rest or pain on movement, and so on. 
So, no, on our impact, I've already indicated we're going to do a bit more on metabolic syndrome. Uh, our major preoccupation at the moment is our CIHR secondary analysis grant, a biopsychosocial approach to understanding the impact of osteoarthritis on social participation. In doing this work, we're using the conceptual framework of the WHO International, work, International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, the ICF. And our overall goal is to try and deconstruct the relationship between OA and social participation, considering several domains. So the site and jo joints involved in OA, pain, activity, and mobility restrictions, and so on. So we expect a kind of a sequence here where osteoarthritis in the joints will lead to pain, which will be associated with, with difficulty in general activities, which will lead to problems, for example, with mobility, and then we want to see the extent to which context, contextual personal factors such as age and gender and environmental factors such as like social support modify these relationships. And the major issue we're grappling with is how to operationalize participation. I was going to, uh, in the flyer, we said we'd talk about our, our work on giving and receiving help as a sort of kind of taster for what we're doing. Unfortunately, when we put all these together, we found we just didn't have time, so we're going to have to talk about that on another occasion. So finally, an acknowledgement. I acknowledge, we acknowledge funding from our CIHR grant and also from the Arthritis Society, who through a um, service contract gave us uh, funding to help document the impact of our privacy population. And in particular, thanks must go to our research associates, Dove, Milstein, and Charlton Zip, Yip, for carrying out a lot of these analyses for us and continuing to work with us on these questions. So I turn now over to you for your questions. Thank you. Let me have to do it. Do we have to do anything now? No, nope, just stand by for one second. Okay. Carol, it seems that you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for your excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, we now open um, the session up for questions. A reminder that everybody's mute remains on, but you can enter your question into the chat box from the bottom right corner of the WebEx window. and. Um, We'll address your question that way. If you want to be identified, uh, go ahead and, and, and put your name there as well, or your affiliation. Um, so we'll jump into the only question that we have now, which is from Nathan. Uh, so what do you think would be missing by only looking for hand, hip, and knee? So I guess the question is, how much OA do you think that we're missing? How much of the, the prevalence out there is probably in the back? or can you kind of address yes, what you of course. think is, is gone there? Yeah, so, so we, we, we're we confident that it's an underestimate by only focusing on the hand, uh, hip, and knee. The literature sort of suggests that the prevalence of back OA probably rivals that of, uh, of knee OA. Uh, <laughs> they're sort of jockeying for position between the most prevalent, and it's always been between the, uh, the knee and the back. Uh, so, I mean, even if the prevalence uh, sort of half more than what we see there because the back has been excluded. Uh, foot OA, and particularly uh, amongst women, uh, is a big problem, but it's been missed here. So from the perspective of trying to understand the impact of the disease at a population level and how it may relate to some of those um, uh, outcomes that uh, Lisa had presented, but also to understand uh, the systemic components to OA. We really need to know how many joints are involved. And again, our hypothesis that if the systemic etiology is one of the pathways, it is more likely that there will be multi-joint OA. But if we don't ask about OA in all of the joints, then it's a, a bit tough to, uh, to, to answer that question. So this is why one of our sort of suggestions for future uh, CLSA surveys would be that uh, it's asked of in every joint. Yeah. Um, 
The second question here is from Amanda asking about the Western Ontario McMaster University Osteoarthritis Index, WOMAC. Uh, are you familiar with that? And it's not, not, <laughs> not through the CLSA. No, it, it doesn't appear in the CLSA. So for those who don't know, so the WOMAC is a uh, joint specific and OA uh, specific uh, measure of lower extremity uh, uh, pain and, sorry, when I say lower extremity, I should say just hip and knee. So it does not include uh, anything else. Uh, so pain and uh, physical function measure in OA. So no, it does not appear in the CLSA. Although that would have been quite nice, but no. Yeah, it's a physical function one asks about uh, pain on things like getting out of the chair, climbing stairs. Um, okay. It was developed specifically for OA, but actually it could be relevant to other conditions. So it kind of gets at that that your concern about asking about the difficulties with activities, not just yeah. the, the needing help for. Correct. Yeah, correct. And, and in terms of, at the moment, it seems to be the industry standard, the WOMAC, in, in terms of studies of OA in the population, particularly around joint replacement. So that's kind of where you would be heading if you could guide more information for for asking about difficulties with the activities, that type yeah. of thing? Not necessarily the WOMAC, but a, a questionnaire that asks about difficulty in sort of the important ADL and IADL, and there are several of those. I mean, it's not just the WOMAC, because I think I'm aware that the CLSA covers all conditions, and I'm also, we're also becoming more aware over time of the importance of comorbidity. Correct. Because as people get older, they acquire more and more comorbidity, comorbidities. So it's not like we're looking at a joint replacement population where, by and large, people may have other conditions, but you're focusing just on the arthritis, I mean, one of the big challenges, I think, is to look at where osteoarthritis sits within the sort of whole package of, people, of comorbidities that people have. And it's often one that tends to get neglected because some of the other conditions, for example, I mean, arguably things like diabetes, are much more salient to individuals. We talk about them a lot more, but when we actually look at the, what's the cause of the difficulty that people have in daily life, the fact that you have heart disease, you have diabetes, and OA could well contribute to making a lot of conditions worse. But we just don't understand this because we just haven't had... I'm sorry, it seems like you're um, kind of fading in and out, so hopefully we'll keep you, keep you here for the rest of the QA session, but we are having a little bit of problems hearing you, I think. Um, so I think maybe that leads into another of your intriguing kind of future directions, which is kind of looking at the longitudinal okay. nature of the data, which is, you know, kind of what happens, particularly for the younger adults, older adults, 45-year-olds who have young oh, onset osteoarthritis, and, and what kind of... Hello? Sorry, you're, you're, you're broken up. We, we can't hear uh, what's being said. Hello? Yes. I'm sorry. It seems like we're having uh, sound difficulties. Catherine, can you hear me? I can hear you. Sorry about the difficulties. I wonder if there's an issue with the WebEx function. Um, Carol, would you mind repeating the question one more time? Sure. Uh, can, can the speakers hear me? Uh, we're we're very very patchy trying to talk to our our presenters. So one of the things that we can do as an alternative, if if it's helpful, is that we can moderate the questions through the chat function. So um, for Lisa and Anthony, one of the things that we'll do is send you the questions via the chat function, and if you're comfortable typing the answers um, or typing a shortened version of the answers, we can do that. But let's try periodically to to test the audio and see if we can get it back up and running. And to the attendees, I apologize for the difficulties that we're having. Hopefully, it'll get sorted out quickly. Can Can you hear us? Hello. There yes. you go. That you sound very good now. Sounds like you're back. So, can you hear us? Okay. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Can you 
hear us? Test weight causing uh, mechanical damage, or do you think that there are other pathways? Uh, so I think part of uh, uh, the issue with metabolic syndrome can be, yes, the excess weight and the excess loading. Uh, the other is that um, uh, metabolic syndrome has been associated with low-grade systemic I apologize, Anthony. It seems as though you've cut out again. Well, we'll, we'll thank our presenters and um, maybe plan to take uh, some questions after the um, conclusion of the webinar here, if we can get our speakers back. But I'd like to thank them very, very much um, and appreciate their participation in our webinar series. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone that the CLS data access request applications are ongoing. And the next deadline for applications is October 16th, so uh, probably too soon, but you can uh, think about it for the future. Please visit the CLSA website under data access to review available data, further information and details about the application process. I'd also like to mention that our next webinar is scheduled for November 13th. We'll be welcoming Dr. Christina Wolfen from McGill University and a principal investigator of the CLSA to speak on their Older Now, a snapshot of self-identified veterans and the CLSA. So we would uh, encourage you to uh, join up for our next month's webinar. So thanks everybody again for attending today's presentation and to our distinguished speakers and for a really wonderful webinar.